Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone here today and um, and we're welcoming tonight author um, Frederick Golder, Golder and he, he's going to be talking about his book, Reaching Common Ground, A Comprehensive Guide to Conflict Resolution. And so welcome, Fred, and we're excited to have you here with us. I'm excited to be here and I want to thank Jeannie, Glenn, and April for getting me involved in this wonderful enterprise, Braver Angels. Uh, as soon as you and I met, I learned about Braver Angels and I became a fan. And you said, how could we not have you talk? Because that's what Braver Angels is all about, reaching across the aisle to find some common ground. So here I am. Uh, let me just tell you briefly about how I came to write the book and then we're gonna have some, some interest, I hope an interesting discussion about it. Uh, I have been a lawyer for a number of years and about, I want to say 25 years ago, I decided that the court wasn't a good place to resolve conflicts and I decided uh, that alternate dispute resolution mediation was a much better way of resolving conflicts. So about 25 years ago, I started teaching conflict resolution, practicing conflict resolution, mediating disputes arbitrating disputes. And I, I th this must have been about five or six years ago, about six years ago, I started seeing a lot of polarization and divisiveness. And I started wondering why were some cases easy to resolve and some cases almost impossible. Some people easy to deal with, some people really difficult. So I did the research I spoke to some really amazing people over the years doing this research, and I wanted to know the dimensions of conflict. So I looked at it from the standpoint of genetics, biology, evolution, psychology, motivation, and personality, because I, I wanted to know what the scientific basis was. And I learned so much, and then I decided this has to be a book, and I have to share these insights with everyone as to why we have so much difficulty getting along. The reds and the blues. One of the things I found is that we often think of in binary terms, we think of either or. Well, guess what? You're not either a blue or a red because there are a lot of variations in between red and blue. You have people on the very far extreme, far right, far left, very deeply red, very deeply blue. Most of us, we find ourselves leaning one way or the other, but not really at the far end or the far extremes. And as I started to do more research, I realized that as strange as it sounds, that there's actually a psychological demand. Glenn would know this. There's actually a psychological dimension to how we lean red or blue. We talk about openness, for example, as some, someone who's likely to lean blue. These are the psychological dimensions, the five, the big five that psychologists like to talk about. And there's actually a genetic component, a personality component to which way we may lean. The environment that we grow up in also may influence us in terms of how we're going to lean right or left. So all of those things I found fascinating. And I wanted to um, share this with you. Um, so one of the first things we talk about, I'm not sure the screen sharing is working here, but let's, um, how are we doing on screen sharing? Can I do that now? Let's see. Okay, so I wanted to have uh, conversations with reds and blues and all the colors in between. And I do talk about much of this in the book. I do talk about political differences as one of the elements of conflict because people do have conflicts over their political leanings. And I have some ideas, some, some methods, some tools that you can use to talk to people who may have different ideas about things. One of the things I found in the research I've done 
is that people sometimes have, uh, how shall we put it? They, um, they judge rather than understand. And we get into trouble when we judge people because people don't want to be judged. They want to be understood. So if we have conversations with people who are different than we are, I see that as an opportunity to learn about different ideas, different concepts. So I never go into a conversation judging people. I go into a conversation trying to learn. And when you go into a conversation trying to learn, you're in a much better place to deal with these differences. So understanding diversity, I'm going to skip to the next one. All right. Diversity in its very broadest sense essentially distinguishes individuals from one another. And by the way, all this is in my book. All of what we're talking about here, I really go in in depth in the book. But when you talk about diversity, you want to talk about all of the differences that distinguish us from one another. There are no two people that are alike. We're all different. And we all have different ideas about things. We form opinions based upon our life experiences and our genetic differences. It all, it makes up us who we are and it makes us special. And when you look at it that way, you want to learn about the differences. There are demographic diversity and those are the genetic things essentially, skin color, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, all of these things are actually come from, from our genetic makeup and it makes us who we are. Those are, those are parts of our diversity. The next is the, in, the, well, I, they call it, I call it experiential diversity, which is really environmental. So just as we have no control over our genes, we get those from our mother and father, we really have no control over where we're born. We have no control over our religion, at least initially when we're young, our ethnicity, our tribe, our ca all of these things that make up who we are. We really have no control over, particularly in the first six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15, 16 years of our life. We, just by the luck of the draw, we're born into a family. And those experiences impact on who we become. And we all have cognitive diversity, which is made up of our different languages, personality, skills, traits, cognitive abilities, neurodiversity, and our physical abilities. And all of these are part of who we are. And now for the best part, we're going to open this up for questions and answers because that's what brave angels do. They don't just talk, they discuss. And they discuss things together without being offensive. We can talk in a way that is civil. So I am welcoming questions about diversity. Anybody have some ideas about what they think of diversity? Don't be bashful out there. Go ahead, Jeannie. No, I just get everyone, since we're a small group, if you'd like, you're welcome to just unmute yourself and ask your question. Easy. I have a question. Please. Fred, um, do you think that there's such a thing as humans having different levels of consciousness, it would affect one's cognitive, it would be under kind of cognitive diversity or emotional intelligence diversity. Do you think that that's a factor? It's a great question. And I, I'd say based on the research, it is, it is a factor. It's interesting. Um, Professor Six Sense Mahaley, I don't know whether or not you know him, but he's an interesting yes. man. We yes. had a really interesting conversation. And what he said was, uh, it wasn't until about 2000 years ago that people actually realized that they had 
an individual consciousness. They thought that the voices in their brain was, were coming from God rather than from themselves. So even though we're genetic, we have genetic predispositions and environmental predispositions, we have the ability to program how we want to respond to our environment to a certain extent. So we can have different levels of consciousness. Um, he talks about flow, for example, and there are times when we're really in sync. You're, you're playing tennis and everything is flowing and almost losing consciousness. You, you're sort of like one with the tennis ball. And there are other times that you can't focus on anything. So yes, I think that there is a much, uh, and there's diversity in terms of consciousness that one has at different stages, sometimes different times of the day, sometimes minute to minute. Well, what about something that's more abiding? Like, yes, um, some of us have more access to flow states than others have. Exactly because, right. Or openness, like you mentioned earlier about the, you know, the blues and so forth. Yes. I, mean, I do think maybe, I want your opinion, that there really are some emotional habits and cognitive habits that have you be able to see more of reality in a realistic way than other people. And so then what do you do with that kind of polarization that's not um, blue red so much, you know, cause those are like horizontal polarization, but more, I, I, I see more than you. I mean, that's hierarchical thinking which is very unpopular in certain circles but I wanna hear your opinion on no, it. We're all different. Some people are taller than others. Some people are shorter than others. Some people are heavier set. They have lighter skin, they have darker skin. Um, people have different cognitive abilities but it doesn't make them better or worse, it just makes them different. They have different cognitive skills. Some people are very musically talented, for example. I know they, that they talk about these different types of intelligence and some people can do some amazing things with music. Some people can do amazing things with physical attributes. So there's yes. all of those different dimensions and it doesn't make us better or worse. It makes us different. And it's those differences that I think make us really fun to be around. Remember now, the one thing we all do share is we're all human and we all share that humanity. And the more we realize that we're all part of that human life force out there, uh, the better we're all gonna be. We can- That's, I agree with that, but I, I'm gonna go back to, but those of us who really, and there are very few probably who really fully embody that oneness of all beings. But those of us who embody that, then we wouldn't see people as better or worse, but we still see more of reality and are better problem solvers. Um, what, do you, what do you think about what I just said there? Uh, Fred, if I could uh, jump in. Uh, I, one of the thoughts that I think bears on this is the notion of you know, neurologically, there, there's a quite a bit of diversity. There's also some similarities we all share as humans. Uh, our brains are made up of different parts that do different things. And we have a very emotional, primitive brain that kind of tends to take charge. And evolution has caused us to mostly want to have it be in charge because it deals with survival. But we have that more higher level rational part, too. And I think all of us are on that journey of finding a way to not let the primitive emotional parts rule us, but to develop our you know, cognitive skills to be more thoughtful and, and uh, balanced in our way of looking at reality. I think that's an important element. And the thing about that is we all, you, you talk about people having uh, good musical abilities born with that way. We're, we all have born with our strengths and weaknesses, but we also know that through experience and practice and learning and training, we can improve in a number of areas. And I think that bears on this too. Yeah, no thank question. you, Glenn. And no. Rita, Rita also has a question. I wanna make sure everybody has a chance. Thanks, Fred. Sure. You, uh, you, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Fred. Uh, thank you so much. This is, you know, this is something that I've looked at 
honestly, I believe in, in getting, I'm 63 years old now. So in getting to know myself as I grew older and older, you know, I do believe that most definitely I have, you know, some time ago come to understand that I have a particular personality that I have always, as long as I can remember, really, really enjoyed people. Um, I've all, you know, I, I say that I've always loved people. I do have an Italian mother, so that kind of, you know, is natural with uh, some of those. <laughs> but um, I did do a lot of, you know, I did do a lot of uh, trying to analyze people. I always loved psychology. I think it started when I was very young and, and I, I remember thinking to myself, well, why do those kids get to be mean to people and I get in trouble for it? Now, this is very elemental, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, well, are their parents not, did the, well, are their parents not getting on to them when they're ugly? You see, because in our house, if we got caught being ugly, oh, I mean, unkindness was just not acceptable. And so we would really get in trouble. So I think it started really young, me going, well, why can they do that? And we can't, you know, because everybody has human feelings, right? That's but right. sometimes, you know, sometimes if we have someone around to say, yes, but that's really not a good feeling to express openly or, you know, in certain ways. But one of the things through my years of looking at sociology and psychology, one of the things that I always go back to, and I believe that um, who spoke first? Uh the lady that spoke first and was talking about the abilities, you know, different abilities. I always look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I look at people and I say, you know, if they're struggling just to, you know, just to be able to put food on their table and put a shelter over their head, there's no way to move to the next level. You know, we know that the top of the pyramid is self-actualization, but that is a journey and so I think that maybe some of what she's talking about, because I know that there are diamonds in the coal in our society that never get uncovered because of lack of, not only lack of opportunity, but also that there aren't those around them that encourage the dusting off of the coal and finding that diamond in, you know, underneath. Yeah. So, and not everybody's, a, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons I, I'm at some point in time, I'm hoping to really encourage our schools to start teaching yeah. psychology at a, a younger yeah. age. Yeah. So, okay. Well, well um, yeah, go ahead, Fred, please. All I was going to say is that I, I am involved in peer mediation, which teaches kids at very young ages, some, um, some as young as in the primary grades, third, fourth, and fifth grade is about peer mediation, which essentially is how to get along with each other, how to resolve conflicts that occur. So I'm, I'm really into getting that information in as young as possible into the schools. So I like your suggestion. And by the way, Glenn, uh, you must have read Kahneman's book about uh, thinking fast and slow because that's what this is about. We generally make decisions emotionally and then we rationalize afterwards. And instead of thinking rationally, we have that tendency to do our decisions emotionally, but we can move beyond that. We don't have to get stuck in our emotional decisions. We can actually stop and think again. That's my colleague Adam Grant would say, think again. All right, well, Fred, um... Um, what's what's in store for us in the uh, next part of your talk? All right, here we go back. Oh, okay. This is something which I cover much more in my book. Uh, we can't see your screen. I'm going to do that in a minute. Um, just have to get the technology down here. Okay, all right. Political tribes. Um, remember, we are not blues or reds. We really have a, we're not binary. 
uh, in terms of how we have the political views that we take. We really are, um, look at it as a prism, right? We start at the very one end and we go all the way to the other end. But in between, there are other groups. Now, the, they studied, when I say they, the group, um, I'll go back to the slide just for a minute. Um, more in common conducted a study, which I borrowed, uh, and they talked about the different political tribes that we have in the United States. And when they did that, they looked at five dimensions of deeply held core beliefs. And they talk about tribalism and group identification. Um, and they do have different groups and it's based on number of factors. Secondly, fear and perception of threat, extent to which people see a dangerous place. And we all are different and we're not, some of them more so, some less, the parenting style and authoritarian, uh, authoritarian disposition. Now you talked about this, uh, you couldn't say anything and other people can say other things. Well, it's because every person grows up in an environment that may have a different parenting style and they may have a different approach to things. So that makes a difference in terms of how you hold beliefs. Moral foundations, the extent to which people endorse certain values. And here's what we have to be careful about. We have to make a distinction between values and opinions, and we can't, I, we can't be the value. So when someone criticizes us or criticizes one of our ideas or opinions, we have to make a distinction between who we are as people and our opinion. And sometimes when people criticize our opinion, we get very defensive and think they're insulting us because they're insulting one of my core values or core beliefs. And it creates animosity sometimes. It, it creates a situation where we want to avoid. And we do that by not making judgments about different people's values but really learning to understand their values. And finally, they talk about personal agency and responsibility. And some people view their personal success as, as a result of individual factors, such as hard work and discipline. And some consider factors such as luck and circumstance. And that makes a difference in terms of how you are going to come to the view of your political position. So they divided, looking at all the data, we're really big into data these days. We used to call it information, but now they call it data. I guess it's pretty much the same. So they took all the data, they put it all together, and they came up with seven political tribes. And Jeannie and I sort of worked on this a little bit because we like the color, right? The progressive activists, the traditional liberals, you notice the blue color, the passive liberals. And then we've got the folks in the, that, that are really, really in the middle, politically disengaged and the moderates. And then we've got the traditional conservatives, you notice the red color and then the devoted conservatives. So we have, uh, we div they have divided this into seven political tribes and probably even more. There are some people, for example, who may be traditional conservatives. Um, and although you think of conservatives as, as being uh, against abortion or um, pro-life, uh, there may be people who fit into the traditional conservative that are in fact um, pro-choice um, or for abortion, and then you get to the progressive activists, and there may be some, some folks in that group even that um, have different ideas about things. So you can't even put people all in one place because we are all different. Even if you might qualify or classify as a traditional liberal, there may be other things that you 
have not in common with other people in that group. So there's groups, there's tribes, but then there's differences even, in, even among the tribes. So if you're a traditional liberal, you could have some other views that might fit more into a traditional or even a devoted conservative. And then I guess we got the libertarians too, it's somewhere, somewhere along the way you could be, uh, you can, I guess you can be a blue libertarian uh, or a red libertarian somewhere along the way. Okay, um, now starting with the progressive activists and they, by the way, they um, look at them and they got the data and said, most of the people that progressive activists are younger, highly engaged, secular, angry, interesting things they study. So 8% it's all in my book. You don't really have to look at this, but just to know that they've put in to the progressive activist group, 8% of the people are in that group. And they have strong ideological views. They're really out there in terms of what they think things should be. And their main concerns are climate change, inequality, and poverty. And speaking of the existential threats that we face, climate change is certainly one of them. Nuclear armaments is certainly a, a, a second one. And a third one might be called, or we might say might be artificial intelligence. Now, the beauty of braver angels and the beauty of learning to talk to each other instead of at each other gives us the opportunity really of solving most of the problems. We could solve climate change, we could solve the nuclear armament and probably even artificial intelligence as we learn to evolve and we learn to communicate with each other. I like to say as a mediator that compromise and collaboration is a lot better than confrontation. Always strive in that direction. So the next group they have a traditional liberals, 11%. The, they call them the baby boomers. And they're very idealistic. They have strong humanitarian values. And it's all in my book. We, we will talk about it some more, but main concern, leadership and division in society. They're really concerned about the polarization. They're concerned about people not learning to get along. The traditional liberals are willing to compromise, unlike the ultra liberal wing. They, the, the traditional liberals, they're willing to compromise and they understand, but they are concerned about the polarization. They'd like to get that fixed and we can do it really. And then we get another significantly large group of passive liberals and they're not very engaged in social. Now remember, this is a picture. It doesn't mean that you could be a passive liberal and be very actively involved in political issues. These are some of the things that they're concerned about. Healthcare, racism and poverty. They're concerned about those social issues. And that is what they are most concerned about. We get to the politically disengaged. Look at this group, 26% of passive liberals, right? They're, they resemble the passive liberals. They're not very engaged. They're not doing very well economically. They're not engaged, but they are concerned about things like gun violence, jobs in the economy, and terrorism. They're, they're all concerned, they, they, they mostly are concerned about those issues. They're not politically engaged. Now, I'm just gonna raise a very interesting statistic. In the 50s and the 60s, the vast majority of people trusted our government. Flip to today, the vast majority of people do not trust our government. How are we going to get that back?
just something to think about. The moderates, another 15% of the people are moderates. They're the middle of public opinion. They're engaged, they volunteer in current affairs and things like that. And they're mostly concerned about the divisiveness, division in, uh, of the people, foreign tensions and healthcare. Um, they recognize a lot of things, but they think maybe things have gone a little too far. So you've already noticed that the vast majority of the people that are out there who are involved are moderate, would say maybe two thirds, maybe more, are, are not on the extreme wings, even though the extreme wings generally generate a lot of the conversation. They're not really so much in terms of percentage. Then we move to the traditional conservatives, which consists of 19%. And they value patriotism and America's Christian foundations. Their main concerns, foreign tensions, jobs, and terrorism. And they have a real clear sense of identity as American, Christian, conservative. They're not like the devoted conservatives, but they are very concerned about law and order. They're very concerned about organization. And we had a brief, I had a brief discussion with Glenn at the beginning. People who are very open, lean blue, people who are not, who are low in that, generally lean to the red and the the conservatives tend to also be very conscientious and they're really concerned about some kind of order they're not interested so much um, in new ideas they're interested in solid stable ideas and then we move to finally the devoted conservatives and they're the counterparts to our progressive activists and they're the, they, at the other end of the spectrum. And uh, just as the study shows, they are one of the highest income earning groups. But you can earn a lot of money and not necessarily be a devoted conservative. This is just average, remember. Um, and their main concerns are immigration, terrorism and the jobs in the economy. And they're concerned about patriotism, loyalty, and they're kind of put out about these so-called quote liberal beliefs, whatever that means. And they think the American values are being rapidly eroded and they see themselves as we're defending the the true values of, of the American world. So those are the, that's in a nutshell, and I talk about that a little bit more. In the book, um, I actually divide my book into three parts. There's the, um, the sources of conflict, the types of conflict that we engage in, and finally, I talk about solutions. And there are some solutions, there's some really well-documented solutions. And I can tell you from my experience as a mediator, they work. They really do. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But before that, on to some questions and answers about the seven political tribes. Go ahead, Jeannie. I think Jeannie caught up. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. And Jeannie's on the phone, I think. Um, I, I have a, a, a kind of a, a question slash comment as I often do, but one of the things that struck me about, that came up on that last slide but really comes up in everything we do is the idea of competing goods or competing values. Yes. Uh, it seems like, for instance, the extremes on both sides have values that they really focus on and they kind of get angry at the other side. But in fact, what off if you really look of what they're into both sides they both have a legitimate moral stance on something but those stances tend to compete with each other and so one side favors one value the other the other 
and they don't give credence to the the value of the other side. And I, I wonder how often you see that uh, contributing to all the polarization and the division we have politically. Yeah, it quite frequently it happens because what we judge, instead of understanding each other, we're judging. So if you attack my values, my core values, I get very insulted because you're attacking me. And, and I don't distinguish between my values and me. And that's where we get into trouble. So instead of attacking your uh, you that way, I don't want to attack. I don't want to judge. What I want to do is I understand. So I might take it this way. I said, that's really interesting. Could you tell me more about that? Instead of how can you think like that? Are you crazy? Instead, you stop and say, that's really interesting. I never thought of that. Where, did, where do you get that? I'm really interested, but you have to be genuine about it because if you have that sarcastic tone in your voice, they're going to say, hey, Glenn, you sound like you're being really sarcastic. What are you talking about? But if you genuinely want to learn and, and here's the thing, we can only see things through our own eyes. It's amazing. We have a filtering system based on our genes and our environment. So of course, you're not gonna see things this, the same way I do. You can't, you don't see things through my eyes, but you do see things through your eyes and I can learn from you if I listen, and right? I listen, creative listening, it's, it's, it's amazing what I learn. Sometimes I solve problems in mediation by not doing much talking at all. I listen and the parties, they keep talking to each other. And I said, as long as they're talking to each other, I'm sort of standing back there. And I had one mediation, they talked and talked for an hour and a half. And they said, thank you so much. What a, we were so, we're so grateful for all the work you did in this mediation. Of course, I didn't do anything. I sit back and did nothing. And they talked to each other. They learned from each other. And by learning from each other, they learned what their needs were and they were able to satisfy their needs mutually. So sometimes mediation doesn't involve compromise. Sometimes you do compromise, but sometimes you can actually satisfy the needs of both sides without necessarily giving up anything. It's really amazing stuff. Rita has a question. Uh, actually, it's more of a comment. I just wanted to share a personal experience that I thought about it for many, many years. Um, I've come to peace with it personally. Uh, but one of the things that as a Christian and actually as someone that was a candidate to be aborted, I have the, my perspective, my personal perspective is that uh, I, I am pro-life. Now that pro-life, a lot of people misunderstand. Pro-life is much deeper than what, you know, we give it credit for. Pro-life is cradle to grave. It's not just about abort. It's not just about babies. It's about the whole life cycle. But what I wanted to share was that the home that I was brought in taught me to respect other people and to understand that we weren't all alike, you know, that we had different experiences. So for a time, I, as a young person, as a young, I knew how I felt about abortion, but I was always trying to understand how I needed to relate to others. So for a time, I wouldn't even, I used to say, well, abortion is wrong for me, but it might be right for someone else. Then after more, you know, after, and it wasn't like I sat around thinking about it, right? Your experiences in life kind of call you to question a little bit more deeply or whatever. I, the second phase that I went through was, okay, I, I came to a deep uh, conviction that, Abortion is wrong, but I still don't have the right to tell another per. For me, it was okay. I there there are other people who do not have my perspective. They weren't raised the way I was. They weren't taught the same things in their faith that I was necessarily. So I live in a country. I don't live in utopia. That's left for heaven. You know, I have to. I don't my personal belief is that God wants me to love people right where they're at. I'm not to try to dictate their lives to them. So while I, you know, I definitely have reasons to be pro-life. Okay. My experiences have taught me that too, because as I said, as a candidate for abortion, 
you know, as you grow older, you realize what, you know, I might not have even been here. Now, none of you would have known the difference, right? <laughs> but I look at my life and I think, wow, I've been, you know, I've had a, I mean, I've had my ups and downs, but life is a beautiful thing when we conquer it, yeah. right? When we conquer yeah. our, so I think that that's where, and it's still kind of one of those things where for me, the fact that we do, that our government is willing to pay for, you know, abortions is yeah. a difficult place for me yeah. because the fact and that I don't believe, you know, I believe that life begins at conception. So yeah. I still don't know the answer, but I do know that I'm not going to, I do know that what God's greatest commandment is, is for me to love him and to love all of his children. And yeah. that means human beings, love doesn't mean that we have this warm fuzzy feeling about everybody love is an action you right. know we might you know we might not yeah. like another person but so right. i hope that that will help i, I hope that kind of illustrates what we're talking about yeah, yeah. and thank thanks for sharing that um rita fred do you have a response to what uh rita was uh, sharing there well the thing is just like in politics we go from the far right to the far left or the red to the blue there's also a, it's not binary, it really isn't. People share from the from some really anti-abortion to really pro-abortion. A lot of people have different views about that whole concept. Some people, for example, want to ban any kind of abortion as other people, um, as you said, Rita, you personally, uh, a very pro-life, but you don't see it as your place to tell someone else how they should deal with that issue. For the, but some people are much more in terms of completely anti. But the real question, you know, you really think about it, and I, I have thought about this quite a, quite a bit. The real question is, in terms of pro-anti, is maybe the better question is, how can we get to a state where we don't have to think so much about abortions. In other words, perhaps the policy should be educating people in a way that there'll be fewer decisions to be made about whether to abort or not. But that's for Can another question. Sure. Jane, yeah. Um, Jane, uh, so, so Fred, you know, between judgment and curious learning, um, where does tolerance come in there? You know, I mean, is that a combination of understanding or honoring uh, a differing opinion or is that something altogether different? Well, that's, uh, that's part of an anachronism. I have this part of my book, which is uh, the T in treat. But tolerance means not necessarily agreeing, but at least accepting the person's position on any particular, whatever the issue is, I am tolerant enough not to insult you because you have an opinion that's different from mine. I'm tolerant about where you are in that area, but I'm not gonna, I, I don't accept it, but I respect or I tolerate your right to have an opinion. There was a really, um, I'm trying to remember who it was that said, I don't believe a word you're saying, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. So <laughs> it's like that. You know, I don't agree with your position, but I will defend to the death your right to express your opinion because it's only through expressing different opinions that we get to move anywhere. I, right. consider, I consider these differences that we have the, the friction, you know, without friction, we have no movement. Without differences, we don't have any progress. So we need the differences. Thank goodness for the differences. That's and, right. Thanks for the and, question, Jane. And Fred, I'm wondering, does, um, does your research bear out, um, you know, the, um, the number of people may be willing, you know, on the heels of tolerance, but being willing to maybe go one step further and maybe say, well, what can I learn from this other person? 
That's what we have to get to, Jeannie. And we can. Once we realize that it's not we against them, it's us. We're all mm -hmm. in this together. Yes. If we don't take care of our planet, if we don't respect our planet, if we overburden our planet, we all suffer. Mm -hmm. If we don't do what we can to have all of our children grow to their full potential, we all suffer. Mm -hmm. Everyone suffers. So when you have someone that has talent, we, we, and one of the earlier um, folks talked about not giving people an opportunity. And some people don't have the opportunity. They are brought up, for example, in a home where the family has been separated, they're a single parent, the mother's on drugs, the father's in jail, all of those things create a terrible problem for the child to grow up and grow us up in an environment that is really harmful. Mm -hmm. And shame on us for not having programs and policies in place that will give that child an opportunity to grow to his or, full, his or her full potential. And I have a selfish reason for that because we waste talent. If we don't let our children grow to their full potential, we're wasting that talent for, for our future generations. So we have to do more, I think, to, to do that. Thanks for amen. your question. Yeah, amen. Um, so, okay, um, so um, what's in store for part three for us? Uh, part three. Your solutions, right? We're going to get to the solutions. That's always a good thing. So from all of this good stuff, um, I put together um, political conversations that we should have going forward. So I put together six steps. Everybody likes steps. So we have six steps that I put together. All of this, by the way, comes from my book and I really discuss it more in more detail, but at least this is something you can all take away from this discussion because I always like to go to a, when I go to a talk and I'm a spectator, I like to have what I call um, some, some gems, right? Something I can take away and use immediately which is why I used to like to teach uh, alternate, I like to teach alternate dispute resolution because that's a class where the students can actually get to use it immediately rather than contracts or torts where they have to wait years sometimes and maybe never use it. So we start out with um, step one. And the step one is we've got to understand the moral foundations for our blues and our reds. Understand that blues rely primarily on these three moral underpinnings. They're very concerned about care, fairness, liberty. That's those, those are the three things that they are most concerned about. So understand when you're dealing with someone who's a blue, that's what they're concerned about. When you're dealing with someone who is a red, not only are they concerned about care, fairness, and liberty, but loyalty, authority, and sanctity also form their moral foundation. Now remember, we're not talking about all blues and all reds, we're talking about in general, average. And it's important to understand that blues and reds, particularly of course, the ones who belong to braver angels, they're all interested in reaching common ground. They're interested in solving problems and resolving conflicts so that we can move forward. We don't like polarization. We don't like divisiveness. We like people to work together to solve problems and resolve conflicts. So those are the kinds of things we wanna think about as we're having conversations with people who are blues or reds. We get to step two. This is really important. Probably the most important thing you can do when you're having a conversation. And April knows this probably better than anyone else because she's really into communication. 
And that is you've got to learn, uh, listen to learn. That's what you have to do. You got to listen to learn. Remember, you're not likely to change anyone's political views or opinions. They have opinions based upon their life experiences and you're not gonna change them. So I, I don't know about you, but I find it liberating because I don't have to worry about changing your mind. I know what my mind is and I don't have to change your mind, but I can find out what your mind is all about. I can listen to you explain to me without making any judgments. I'm here to understand you. And I'm gonna maybe ask you some open-ended questions. I'm not gonna be asking you any questions. They're gonna create problems because I'm here to learn. And I'm gonna give the person I'm speaking to feedback. So the person knows I'm listening and I'm listening very carefully so that I can have a constructive conversation. And I'll be asking open-ended questions and that's how I get to learn things. The what, who, where, when. Now, as a lawyer trying cases, those are the questions you would ask. What, who, where, when. You never ask the why questions, but when you're learning to listen, uh, listening to learn, you wanna ask the why questions. All of that is important so that you can understand better the person you are communicating with. And then to make sure you summarize what you heard. Because sometimes you listen and you may not understand exactly what they said. And some people will say something and you'll say, did you say this? And even if they did say what you think they said, they didn't mean to say that and they change it. And you learn as you're going through this communication dance, so to speak, you learn more. And then you get a confirmation of understanding. Good listening requires an open mind. It really does. And it has to be authentic. These are the skills that I use or try to use as a mediator. Inquiry, paraphrasing, and acknowledgement. People like to be acknowledged. We all do. Step three, keep an open mind. We have decided through our life experiences that our opinions are valid. And if they have different opinions, they must be wrong because our opinions have to be right. And we have sometimes the danger of assuming the worst in people. We call it the demonizing effect. And we're always treating ourselves much better. The halo effect. And I always encourage people when I'm mediating not to think in binary terms. I'm always trying to create more options. The more options I can create, the better I can find a solution that is gonna solve the problem. So when you're talking to someone who may be of a different political party or political opinion or philosophy, keep an open mind. And don't challenge their core values. That's not the way to understand them. And this is one of my favorites, step four, empathy. The more we use empathy, the better we can communicate with each other. We want to see things through the eyes of the other person. We want to look at them in a neutral, non-judgmental way. And oftentimes, at the beginning of a mediation, the parties are very emotionally distraught. When I do a domestic relations mediation, the emotions are all over the place. They're very, very difficult. Union, union management disputes, very emotional. The many mediations that I have, there are a lot of emotional issues. So when you're communicating with someone from a different political perspective, you want to acknowledge that they get very hot 
very heated about it. And you can see on the news media how people get really excited about their political positions. The idea is we want to understand each other. We're not blaming, we're understanding. That's the use of empathy. And step five, you, when you're having this conversation with someone from a different political philosophy or persuasion, you want them to understand your point of view. You want to state your positive intent. You want to tell your truth, express your feelings, but you're not judging, attributing, or blaming. You're speaking to them so that they can understand you. And finally, the most important right, when I think, well, they're all important, really. You want to work together. People that are blues and reds and all the colors in between want solutions to problems. The people that are blues are not bad Americans. The people that are red are not bad Americans. They all want what they think is their American version or their version of America, right? We all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the American creed. However, if you're a blue or a red or somewhere in between, what that means is different depending upon where you are on that ideological prism, but you all essentially want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's just different ways to get there. But the way to get there is not to blame and judge, but it really is to work together and find solutions. They did a bipartisan just the other day, right? Everyone, uh, or at least uh, the, the majority of the people in the house decided that infrastructure was something that we're gonna to pass together. And they did, they worked together, they hammered it out. And there we go, we have something that is important to both sides and to all of us. Okay, back to our questions and answers. Jeannie, how you doing? Good, um, I like what you said about the thing about the dehumanizing and um, I think it's interesting because I think, um, you know, that when we dehumanize other people, that can be a real first step toward things really just breaking down. Um, and um, so do you have pointers for us maybe on how we can um, avoid dehumanizing those with whom we disagree or don't that's agree a, that's, with? A, that's a great question. I will tell you that very oftentimes when we're having communications um, we have a tendency as human to blame the other person as being not understanding. We all, anytime there's a conflict, anytime you have a disagreement, it's generally both sides have some role in all of this, but we always point to the other person as being more responsible for these problems than ourselves. And that's just human nature, but we can move beyond human nature by stepping back, um, Glenn talked about this a little bit, which is we have to realize that we may get our emotional buttons pressed. We may get a trigger. Somebody may trigger us and get us really angry. So we have to take a couple of deep breaths, uh, step back, uh, acknowledge perhaps to ourselves, and even at some point in time, so you know, when we get into those heated discussions, sometimes we call, I call it uh, the we're going to take a walk on the balcony. You know, I said, you know, this is a good time to take a break. Uh, you know what? Um, I'd like a cup of coffee. Why don't I go get a cup of coffee? You go back. Um, I'll see you in about five minutes. When you get to the point where your emotions are working harder and you're into that situation, you don't want to let your emotions run with your ideas because it creates that terrible thing because I get angry, you get angry, and before you know it, uh, we're at war. 
and we don't want to be at war. So when you realize you're getting this emotionally, you're getting, you're feeling in the stomach, oh my God, I want to kill this person. You know, you say, aha, uh -huh. I think, uh, you know, this might not be a bad idea to take a break. And you take a break, take a couple of, you go out into the fresh air, maybe you do your media, you do your meditation before you get back to your mediation. You, you try to take a couple of deep, deep breaths and you say, you know what? Life is good. And you say, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna not let my emotions rule how I'm gonna deal with this person. I'm gonna find out some more. But it doesn't always work, Jeannie. But we're basically, we're evolving. We're an act in progress. You know, we're never gonna get it perfect. We're never gonna get it perfect, but we can work to get it better. We can continue to make an effort to make it better. And you know what I like about Braver Angels? I know I'm giving you a pitch, but the Braver Angels said, we have a problem and you took action to make a difference. So instead of complaining, it's easy to complain about the darkness. It's easy to complain about the polarization and the divisiveness. And Brave Angel said, yeah, we're not gonna just complain about it. We're gonna do something about it. And you get people to come to speak about sometimes some really diverse subjects, some really polarizing areas, and you get people to talk about it civilly. And that's one of the things that uh, really resonates with me uh, and with resonates with Braver Angels, which is where we should all be moving. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Rita. Oh, I'm sorry. Glenn was raising his hand. I, I was just going to tell you briefly that I took the liberty of adding to the chat uh, some information about Braver Angels and our website, Facebook page, and some of the places. That'll come next. That'll come next, Glenn. Now, okay. that, I, I got it down at the end. At the very end, we're going to put that okay. in there. Right. Just want to let people no, know. No, no, no. Yeah, because we want to give people the opportunity to join um, Braver Angels and, be, and to be part of a, a movement. I don't consider it just an organization. It's a movement of trying to learn to navigate civilly in a sometimes a turbulent world, but we can do it and we will. We, we, we are, we are doing it. So what have we got left? I, I was gonna, I was gonna, if you don't mind, Fred, I wanted to make a, uh, give a, tell a small story about empathy. Uh, I talk to people that have been on events with me, you know, they probably get tired of me referencing my parents, but the reality is, is that when you're young, you think you're not listening to them. As you grow older, <laughs> you go, oh, wow, I did hear what they were telling me. Uh, but when I was in, you know, very young, uh, you know, elementary school, I remember coming home one day and talk, talking to my, uh, my parents about that kid. Why are, you know, their kids are so mean, you know, they just really, you know, they hurt my feelings and blah, blah, blah. You know, why do kids, why are kids mean? And I remember one morning my mom said, to, I think it was my mom. She said, well, now let's think about this for a minute. She said, now, you know, that kid, that child before they got to school, what if something bad had happened to them? You know, what if their mom was really upset with them? What if they got a spanking before they got to school? And she said, you know, that would put anybody in a bad mood. And she said, you know, it's not necessarily that they were actually really angry at you, but they were angry because of something that had happened. And so, and you know, that was, that was you know, in my young mind at that time, you know, naturally we're young, you know, we're learning at that period. But as I got to be an adult, I just saw the wisdom, you know, that they were imparting because that's the way we must, you know, that's why I never assume, which my dad always told me when you assume you make an ass out of both you and me. But uh, he said, you know, don't ever assume that you know something about another person. If you do not really know that person, you don't know because you haven't been with them. And likewise, I always told my daughters as I was raising them, 
personalities blend differently. Do not ever trust what one of your friends tells you about another person, not that you shouldn't trust them, but that their perspective will be different because your personalities are different. And you might get along with someone really well that they cannot get along with. So I think that we, if we teach these things to our children as they grow, that I think that they'll, these lessons come back to them in their adult years where they're beginning to experience things that really show proof of some of the lessons they're trying to, to teach. Did we lose? Did we lose Fred? Fred, are you still with us? <laughs> I think we've lost Fred. Okay. Maybe Karen's going to go get him. Okay. Rita, I put it in the chat, but there's a phrase that we use um, in the kinds of mediation that I do about hurt people hurt I people. Have, I have used that so often in explaining, yes. I mean, you know, when you get those little nuggets, I mean, they're so simple to say, right? But they really explain a lot. So thank you, yeah, I use that often. <laughs> well, it just seemed like it was the gist of the story you were exactly. telling. Exactly, it was, exactly. Now, who do you work with, Susan? What kind of- I, I do permanency mediation. So children who are involved in the child welfare system. Oh, wow. Okay. Children in foster care. And Fred is one of the mediators on our roster or he's joining oh, our roster very soon. Well, God so, bless you and Fred and everybody else that works with that. That's, that's where we, our children are the future, right? And we do want to work with one another, but my goodness, our children are the ones that we really, you know, that was what was most upsetting to me about the division I was seeing because I thought about my grandchildren and I thought, I don't want to leave this world with, you okay. know, worrying about my Fred's back. Fred's back. So we'll get Fred. I have, uh, okay. a slight technical difficulty. Sorry about that. Listen, thank you very much for sharing that. That was excellent. Um, anyway. Um, we can't, can you turn your video on, Fred? We can't see you. That's okay. We're working on it. Okay. I'm working on it. I, uh, hold on. We're going to do this. Okay. You'll invite me back in again. <laughs> okay. Hold on. And um, just so everybody knows, we, we are recording this um, session with Fred tonight so that it can be shared for subsequent viewing on yes. the, um, the Central Arkansas Library System YouTube channel and um, probably maybe the Braver Angel Central Arkansas channel, if that's uh, what Glenn thinks would be best, Glenn in April. So, um, and then at the end, for anyone who's interested, we're going to try and do like a group shot, um, just, you know, of like everybody saying hello, who was on, on part of the meeting, so. If we do that group shot, we might actually get everybody in uh, the uh, newsletter. Uh, through yes. The yeah, that'd be nice. Okay, here we go. We're working on it. Okay. Okay, you can let me in and I'll be back. Okay, I, 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 okay, yes. Okay. Let me shut this off. Have we lost Fred again? I think he's the yes at the, whoop, nope, now we did lose him. No, he's oh, here. There he is, the there yes is. at the bottom. He needs to unmute. Okay. You're still muted, Fred. You're gonna be on, thanks, Susan. <laughs> there you go. Technical difficulties, ah, here we go. All right. It's all good.
everybody take a deep breath. We're going to have a bit of meditation. <laughs> okay. Us all down. <laughs> okay. And yes, Miller has also put in the chat, um, Fred, uh, we want to be mindful of our time here to, for, to make sure you have enough time to present. And we're, I'm going to kindly ask that if people do have something to say, they limit it to 30 seconds, if possible, because uh, Mr. Miller has inquired, uh, will there be time at the end to open yeah, the floor yeah, for a group discussion? That. We have to do that. Okay, so I'm going to go through this quickly because I really want to give uh, some opportunities for discussion. So from my book, um, Reaching Common Ground, I've developed some axioms, um, which you should keep in mind. Axiom number one, you cannot change the past, but you can learn from it. So don't get excited about what you did yesterday because you can't change it, but we can learn from it and move forward. Axiom number two, we're shaped by our genes, life experiences, and they create, we have differences in our cognitive abilities, perceptual motor skills and personality. That's just it. You know, the luck of the draw. We're born with certain genes and life experiences that, that occur and there's nothing we can do about it. That's just the way it is right now. Axiom number three, from those life experiences and from our genes, we form beliefs, opinions, values, attitudes, judgments, and all of these motivate us to act in particular ways when responding to internal right? Internal and external stimuli, right? We are actors in the world. Axiom number four, no one can change anyone else's beliefs, opinions, values, attitudes, or judgments. Now, I may say something that will make you question your beliefs, but I can't change it only you can do that. All I can do is provide information. And from that information, you may change your belief opinion, but I can't do it. And all of us are motivated to act to satisfy our perceived needs. I, I like to put perceived because sometimes it turns out that our needs um, that we think we need Actually, we do not, but we perceive them. And I, I, it might have been Rita that talked about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but we all have needs and we have to satisfy those needs. And we may act differently depending on our personalities. And finally, let's, oh, well, there's one more. We generally act in ways that we perceive will satisfy our best interests or needs, but that's not always the case. Sometimes, we act in ways that will not necessarily, but we perceive them that way. And finally, um, in fact, it doesn't matter about our differences. We can learn to work together, solve problems, resolve conflicts and reach common ground. Now, we can have some questions. Um, well, Fred, I have one. Um, you mentioned the thing about not getting stuck in the past. Um, you know, when we know people that do seem to be stuck in the past due to, you know, an encounter they had or encounters with, you know, maybe through a particular relationship and they, it's almost like they're shackled, you know, they're crippled, you know, they're like emotionally damaged from that kind of a thing. Are there ways... Um, that, you know, how can we talk to people like that? Um, you know, cause we, you know, we, we don't want to push somebody if they're fragile, we don't want to push them over the edge. But on the other hand, you know, how can we have an honest conversation? And yeah. to kind of, yeah. There was a wonderful book uh, written involving trauma and people suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder sometimes uh, people have served in the armed forces. Uh, sometimes people are victims of abuse. Uh, and these are people that get stuck in the past, as you suggest. And the only way to get through that, really, 
is through a therapeutic program. There's some, um, sometimes they work in cognitive behavioral therapy. Glenn would probably be able to address this better than I would. My field of expertise is not in psychology, but I know that there are programs out there and there are people that do get stuck in the past and something will trigger uh, because of a past event and they will be living it as if they were living it in the present, even though it was something that might've happened 25 or 30 years ago. I once represented um, a young Catholic man who was abused by a priest. And it's an awful thing, but he was living in the past. He couldn't get beyond what his past was until he went through a therapeutic program to get through that. And there's, they have made some really amazing strides as I've done some reading in terms of the kind of therapy that one needs to get through that so that they can live in the present. Even though they can't change the past, they get stuck, they can get stuck in it. And that's you know, the you and you can't change the past, but you can change the present going forward. And Glenn, do you have any follow up on that? As since uh, Fred uh, mentioned that uh, that you might have some insight on that. Yeah, I was actually in the middle of responding to one of the comments that's related to that. Uh, there are a number of uh, evidence based uh, types of therapy now that have been shown to be helpful for a lot of people who uh, experience various types of trauma. Uh, and one of the things that I, I was about, and anyway, so I'd say if, if, if that's the case, then you just you know, need to talk to a qualified therapist who's used to working with uh, trauma stuff. But the, the thing I've mentioned before and I mentioned in the uh, chat is the importance of, if you're having a conversation, it doesn't matter if it's somebody who's really vulnerable or just you know anybody, we all have a brain that tends to go toward the emotional if things get too difficult. And the best thing we can do is do everything we can to keep the emotional tone in a conversation at a moderate to low level, because the more we get the emotions up, the more we start losing our best judgment and our ability to think through things. And we start to act in real um, instinctive ways, usually not with the, and at that point, I like to say, when we're operating through emotion, our, our brain, we lose quite a few IQ points at that at that time. So that would be one of the main things I'd say. I was about to mention something about the uh, comment, the letter somebody was talking about, having heard uh, referring to Dr. Uh, Bruce Perry and uh, Oprah Winfrey's uh, book. And I just remember hearing him back uh, when I was at the Med Center uh, in the early mm -hmm. 90s. And he was talking, he did some groundbreaking research on the effect of trauma in childhood and how it impacts the brain and kind of stays with you over time. But the bottom line is there's always a way to change and improve yourself. It may be a long haul, it may be slow, it may be tough, but we are not stuck with how we were born or how we were raised. We do have the capacity to, uh, if we take the right approaches to change things. And I think that's what Braver Angels does uh, is to provide training in several approaches that have been known to be helpful at keeping the emotional tone low in a conversation and to help people be more able to hear the other person. Thank you so much for that follow-up, Glenn. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions for Fred at this point? I'm trying to remember the name of the book that I read recently and it deals with trauma and it deals with some of the new techniques they're using to deal with trauma, to get the people to deal with the trauma so that they can move on with their lives. I tell you the strides that they've made in the last 10 years in terms of the neuro, the biology, the genetics, the stuff that we didn't know 10 years ago, they've they're learning, they're doing the mapping, the genome. It's just crazy stuff, but it's really amazing.
If I, fi if I remember the name of the book, I'll tell you. I just can't remember the name of the book right now. Uh, is it okay if I chime in at this time? Yes, of course. Perfect. So um, I wanted to first say thank you, Fred, for your presentation. And I wanted to go back to the, the woman was talking about, uh, I believe she was talking about capacity. Um, and we started talking about realities and things like that. And uh, I wanted to open up the discussion for everyone else on the, you know, maybe some people who haven't spoken and just get your thoughts or opinions on realities because um, I, thought, I found it very interesting that we were saying, you know, everyone has a, a reality is subjective. So um, everyone has a different reality. And we were talking about people's capabilities to grip, comes to grip, come to grips with realities. And I'm not quite sure what she was saying. I was hoping that she could repeat it. Um, but I was, I was curious to get people's thoughts on that. It, it was, I, I found that very interesting. Um, especially because I think it's subjective. That's a that's an excellent question and a good thought for discussion about the perception because our perception becomes our reality, uh, and we all look at life through our lens because that's the only lens we have. Uh, and we, I can tell you from my experiences that we can look at the same thing and come to a different conclusion. Some people who are really brilliant scientists, they can look at the same set of data and come to different conclusions about it. And I think it's an interesting topic to discuss. So yes, you have opened the door. Who else wants to chime in? This is a good one. Uh, Fred, do you know the, the woman who, um originally mentioned this? I, I didn't know, I didn't catch her name. She was the first person to speak. Uh, it, was it Phyllis? Did Phyllis mention that? I don't remember. I'm not it, sure. I was think it, it was the other Susan and she's not here anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, the okay. Other Susan. I, made, I, I made a comment on that and I can, I understood what she was talking about. Um, did it, you know, and my point was that, um, when you talk about capacity, I can tell you that I am a, I am what I would, I'm not a, you know, when it's really funny because I learned, I'm very comfortable telling you, I learn slowly. Okay. I don't mean that I'm slow. I mean that my brain, I do have an ADHD brain that was diagnosed back in 2003 that I was unaware of. I was totally unaware of it, which most people with ADHD are and everybody around them knows it, but they're not so familiar that that's the issue. But what I found was that um, we do, you know, I realized I've always been a decent student, but I also realized that I tend to need to understand things. It's not real, I'm not the kind of person that likes somebody to give me a simple explanation because for me, there are, you know, there are too many important things that need more explanation. There, you know, so for me, even though I just, I never thought about it much when I was growing up, but I married a man that is a, you know, he was a nuclear power. He and I are total opposites. I come from an Italian mother that, you know, where my feelings were every, you know, I, tr I relied on feelings to figure out, you know, what was right and what was wrong. And there was definitely a place for that. I mean, I believe that people, we, we have to have a balance of things, but we, but my, my husband, because he challenged me so much in being so opposite of me now he does have feelings but he sure could fool me a lot of times uh so what I'm saying is that we both have talents and gifts that help me to see things that he might not see but at the same time that he helped me to see things that I couldn't see because of my personal you know my mental capacity to look at things in a particular way so, and you know, talking about opportunity, we're talking about 
we're talking about education. If a person hasn't had the opportunity to get a full education, that does not mean they don't have the capacity for it. Unfortunately, it means that they have not been given the opportunity to invest, you know, to further um, express what, what's in there already, you know, what those capacities are. So yes, when you ask that question, is that what you're, I, I, I'm not certain if I understand the question, but is that anywhere close to what you're asking? Well, let me put it this way, Rita, um, you really triggered something in my mind, which I think I want to share with all of you, and that is that men and women communicate differently. That's not a surprise to you, right? We know that we do, but this is really interesting. We complement each other. The differences that we have, men as a rule, and this is just general, they're interested in doing, accomplishing goals, and women are more, generally speaking, into developing relationships. So we really are different in that respect. That doesn't mean better, but it means that we need each other, we complement each other. And so that, in my mind, says that's exactly what reds and blues are about. If you really think about it, we are different, but we complement each other and we need each other to get things done. Here, here. Thank you, Gwen. It looks like Barbara has her hand up. Barbara, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, here's my question. Let me lower my hand. Um, like specifically about this thing, for example, with the, um, whether it's an insurrection or whatever, when you're talking to people, because we're coming up upon January 6th again quickly. And I'm wondering, do we, we just listen to people? Tell what they see and, and do all the steps that you say and, and nod and, and, you know, try to put, I mean, obviously I need to put this, it would be a good idea if I practiced this, wouldn't it? Like I was, uh, you know, in theater or something. I would actually pretend that I was listening to someone tell me what their point of view is and then nod and write it all out. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Fred? Because I know that's going to come up. <laughs> Doesn't work quite like that. Um, <laughs> you really have to be genuine because- Oh, I am genuine. I'm not, oh, don't misunderstand me. I am genuine. I really am. No, but really you, can't, you, you can't nod and shake your head. You really have to be engaged. When you talk about active listening, you're really engaged. So what it means is you're listening to them and that doesn't mean agreeing with them. You listen to them and when they've told their story, remember, April can tell you more about communication than I could ever hope to tell you, but insurrection, it's a word. People use words that have emotion tied to them. There's the connotation and there's the denotation. There's the, what the word means and what emotion it brings when you use the word. So when you say insurrection, that sounds like really <laughs> awful stuff, right? Insurrection, oh my goodness gracious. That's really serious. So what you do is you talk. And then you tell your truth, though. You're not going to simply sit back and listen, and they're going to talk about what they did and why they did it. Once you understand what they did and why they did it, then you're going to be able to say your truth, which is, I understand where you're coming from. I don't necessarily agree with you. This is what I think, and this is why I think the way I think. And then you can have a constructive dialogue. But if the first thing you say is, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind, right? You might be thinking that, you might, you might be thinking that, but if you wanna say that, you're not gonna have a constructive conversation. What you're right, gonna have okay. is an argument, a good old fashioned argument, and you're never gonna have community. Now, you may just decide, this is someone I don't wanna communicate with, and then you say, well, it's been nice talking to you. I'll see you later. Well, maybe I could say, um the episode on January 6th, is it, and not say it sarcastically. Okay, yeah, no, thank that you. That was an event, that was an event that occurred. You can make an observation, you say, people were, and you can say what they were doing. They were uh, breaking into the Capitol with signs, breaking windows. That's an observation that you made. Now, 
their point of view might be, we were trying to save the country from the despots. That's what they might've been thinking. We don't know. But the thing is, you don't know anything until you've asked the questions, right. right? Then you say, why did you do that? Why did you break into the Capitol? Because that's, they, they did that. They went in there, they broke windows, they pushed the doors open, they did all of those things. And so your question is, well, I'm curious as to why you did that. Um, and they said, well, the election was stolen. And then you have to ask you, well, we're not sure what that, what, what do you mean the election was stolen? Uh, and then you get into questions. I was going to say, Fred, yeah. Yeah, the, my thought on this, it's only my opinion, but th these are good uh, techniques for everyone. However, my belief is that the maybe five to 10% on each extreme end, left and right, are going to be the hardest to get to. But we don't need that 20% of the country to kind of save our democracy. We need about the middle two thirds and the middle two thirds are more amenable to the right kind of approach like we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. 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 And, and um, I, following on what Glenn said, I think it's lovely, um, the whole thing um, that Fred just brought out about, you know, the importance of asking questions because I have found that so often we think we understand what a person is saying and because, but we are understanding that from our own frame of reference and our own frame of reference, of course, is our own life experiences, um, you know, the, the meaning we attach to words, all of that. And so sometimes our understanding is not quite correct because our frame of, every, everyone's frame of reference is unique. So I think it's very important to ask those clarifying questions um, in other words, you know, we listen, but we seek to understand as well. Yes, and, and you, you're making Yes's point. And Yes's point is we do look at things differently because we can't look at them any other way than the way we look at them. And we don't see the platonic truth. We see our truth. And it's our truth based upon our life experiences. We can't see it any other way. So when someone sees it differently, we can't, I mean, it's not, a, it's not really appropriate to say it's wrong. What we can say is, from your perspective, I understand where you're coming from, right? I don't agree with you, but I completely understand where you're coming from. One of my favorite books and one of my favorite movies was To Kill a Mockingbird. And I remember um, when Atticus was talking to uh, Scout, he said, you don't know another man until you've walked in his shoes. And it's sort of like that. You really don't until you've walked in somebody else's shoes to really understand. And I think Rita pointed this out. You don't know what kind of day the person has had, and then they come to you. They might have had the worst day of their life, and then you meet them, and this is not who they are. This just happens to be a bad day. And people do have bad days and they need, they don't need to be taunted. They don't need to be insulted, humiliated. They need a hug sometimes. You just give somebody a hug. Although one thing I have to tell you that I really appreciate, um, the pandemic has taught me that we all matter and we all count. And the, from, the from the store clerk, to the farmer, to the people who pick the groceries, uh, to, to the, who plant the, the crops, to pick the crops, all of those things. Boy, it's amazing how we are so interconnected and we really do need each other. Amen. Well, um, Fred, we have about 20 minutes left and I just wanna make sure that you have a chance to finish and that we have a little bit of time at the end. Yeah, well, for thank some... you for that. But I, I think that I've said what, uh, what I really think I needed to say about the book. Um, I can tell you that um, you don't need to read the book, but it's helpful because it has a lot in it that will help you understand why we have these differences and how we can work through these differences to really reach common ground. I mean, my, my goal was to try to get people to communicate in a way that empowered them, uh, made them feel 
which we all are, we're human and we like to feel valued. We like to be respected. And we like to feel that we're counted, that we matter. And we start from the very beginning, you know, as, as Rita's parents started from the very beginning, we treat people as humans and we respect people, we value them and we give them an opportunity to grow. It's so important to have these attachments that we have as young children. And if we're not fortunate enough to have those attachments, we really start out um, in a bad way. But as Glenn said, even though we have these genetic and environmental factors that impact on us, we have the ability as we become adults to move beyond that. The conversations I'd had with uh, Professor Six Sense Mihaly used to talk, he talked about becoming, being. You can move beyond that and you can actually, uh, you can make your own movie. You can play your own movie. Even though you might have predisposition to work in a certain way or to think in a certain way, you can move beyond it. You can say, you know what? This is how I think, but I can go beyond that. I have the ability to change the way I think about things. And even though I've got the genes and even though I've got the environment, I really have the ability to move beyond that and to be the person I want to be. You know, I can continue to evolve. We're, we're evolving. Um, sometimes I think we're, we're evolving. Maybe, uh, maybe we're not evolving quickly enough to uh, match our environment. Maybe we're going too fast, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so was your PowerPoint finished, Fred? Everything that you had or? I am, I am done with the PowerPoint. Uh, we can stay around for questions or people can go and uh, whatever. Okay. Um, the only thing I would ask is there, there is an informational um, slide I'm gonna at the very- that. I'm gonna do that next because I don't okay. wanna, yep, okay. no, no, I don't wanna forget that because I want everybody to have the opportunity um, and then when we come back from that, I think we had a couple more questions. Yes. And we also want to get a picture. Yes. Okay. This is what I want everyone to see. Um, we are very fortunate to have some wonderful people involved in the Braver Angels organization. Uh, and this is all the good information uh, of Central Arkansas. And if you're in different parts of the country, um, you can still be part of Central Arkansas, but they have wonderful um, groups all over the place. I just joined in Massachusetts and New England um, and I'm joining up with them. So you look around and you find uh, wherever you are, there's gonna be a Braver Angels group that you can join. And Fred, let me mention that I put in the chat some information, a lot of this same stuff, but I noticed your slide there uh, has hyperlinks, but you know, we're not going to be able to see the hyperlinks on the other end. So the, I actually have a, the website spelled out uh, in the chat uh, for the, our uh, for the uh, for our website and for the national website. Great. Okay, folks, go to the chat, and I'm going to leave this up so you can copy it, and then of course you can do, go to the chat, and if you have questions. I don't necessarily know that I'm going to give you the answers, but at least uh, we can have a nice discussion and conversation. Okay, Fred, I think um, Glenn has the information in the chat. If you want to stop your screen sharing, that way we can see everybody. Okay. All right. If that's okay. And then um, we can, Rita has her hand up, so we want to get her question, and then we'll take questions. And then as April mentioned, we do want to get a group shot before we log off. So um, Rita, if you want to go ahead, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I had two questions, Fred. First of all, not to embarrass anyone, but do you have any family members here attending with you tonight? I have my wife, if she's still here. Uh, I, saw, I noticed her. I noticed her name. I, I noticed the name Gold. She left. <laughs> well, we're gonna hopefully. Cannot, there she listen. is! Yay! All right. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you here with us, Miss Golder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second question was I already heard I, too much of me. <laughs> I was still curious as to whether or not 
Um, I and I know it wasn't addressed to me, but I want to make sure that I understood Yes's question about what Susan had shared. If uh, was yes. there, I, I thought that Yes was talking about differences, about different realities. In other words, it, it, you can you see your reality, but your reality is not necessarily someone else's reality. Right. I understand what Yes had to talk about. So you see things from your eyes um, and for you, that's your reality, but someone else sees them through their eyes and for them, that's their reality. It's like the, um, I, I think the example was the blind people feeling different parts right. of the other and they no, see. I, yeah, I, under, I understand that very well. Uh, I think that, Empathy, uh, one of my favorite definitions for empathy is your pain in my heart. So what I was asking though about, I'm not certain that I understand, I thought I understood what Susan was saying, but I do believe that it's possible for people to step out of their own personal realities and put themselves in, you know, imagine another uh, perspective, not that, like you said, not that we embrace it, but we kind of step out of our personal reality and we, you know, it's my parents used to use that very same thing. Uh, you, you don't judge a man until you've mo walked a mile in his shoes. And so that informed a lot of the way I looked at, you know, the way I would relate to other people. And so I just wonder if, and I have never asked people, it's just something that is natural for me, but do other people find that they are able to do that? Or is it really as, you know, to me, I guess I kind of thought that most people do that, but. Yeah, some people are natural empaths. They can look and really feel the other person's pain. They can do that. And there are different degrees. Some people have no empathy at all. Um, people, for example, who are high on narcissism, I write that, that is in my book, I talk about narcissism. If you're very high on, on narcissism, it's almost impossible for you to look into anybody else's, you can't be an, empath, an empathetic person and a narcissist at a very high level. So uh, there are different levels. And it, but you can learn to be more empathetic. You could learn to do that if you choose to do it. Can I can I chime in uh, really quick to respond Please. for that? Because with Rita, um, yeah, Rita, I, I'm glad you asked that because I think I, now that we're talking about it, I don't know if I was super clear on uh, what Susan was saying. But the, the so so we, I understand. Um, you know, everyone has their own differences and things like that. And, um, but the part that I found interesting was she said, um, you know, there was a hierarchy and, and some people have a, a stronger ability to come to grips with reality. And I think that's what struck me. Um, and, and I wish she was here to, to, to kind of further expound on it. I know um, what you're, I understand yeah. what you're, I understand what you're saying. Yes. And I, I don't think the way that I took what she was saying I took it more, that's why I brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because I have seen that, I've personally witnessed that with people in my life. You know, my husband, I came from a very humble home, a very happy home, but, you know, we, material things to us, I mean, we had everything we needed, okay? But my my life with my husband has been quite different. I live quite, you know, a comfortable life, which I, it wasn't that I didn't have a comfortable life growing up, but, you know, the it's very interesting. I used to think some people would just roll over and die if they didn't have certain things when I know full well, you can live without a lot of things and, and be just fine. It's just kind of a, an attitude, you know, it's, it's what you believe you have to have to survive. And I, what I was thinking was, you know, until I, you know, until I moved from one socioeconomic group to the other, what I realized is that there are a lot of opportunities 
with socioeconomic um, advantage, but it doesn't mean, you know, I don't, I believe that we all, what we're born with, we have the capacity for, but so it's not like one person is smarter than another. It's just that they have the ability to um, nurture what they've got. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and I might've misunderstood her. Uh, that's why I was kind of interested in hearing more about your question. It looks like Rudy might have something to share. Interesting conversation. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I had to unmute. Well, I don't have anything to add about this, uh, about what you were talking about. I, I apologize. Uh, I don't have a segue, but uh, what I, um, so my question uh, is, uh, how do people who are like, like you, you all are interested in engaging with, with people differing points of view and, and uh, getting to know each other better. What opportunities do you find in the community uh, to do that? Um, Bra Braver Angels okay, is one way to do that. In other words, Braver Angels has a lot of these talks about different subjects and you get to engage people that way. There's always organizations, there are always groups that, that you can join. And it's just really a question of what is interesting to you. And that's how you get to meet people. And you don't necessarily have to go to places where they're gonna agree with you. You can go to places where they'll disagree. And Braver Angels, for example, have different perspectives, different points of view. Some people um, have a view about, um, we'll use the example of, of red. They're, they lean to the red and some people lean to the blue but they can talk to each other, even though they have different ideas about how to do things, they're at least willing to talk to each other, to listen to each other, and perhaps work together to find some solution to whatever their problem or conflict is. Yeah, and Fred Glenn, I think, probably has some good input on that because he lives here in central Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, really, thanks for the question. Um, I, yeah, I think it, I'm gonna talk from the standpoint of what we do in Braver Angels. One of the things that we would love to do, and we've been doing this for about three years now, is to come to churches, clubs, organizations, groups of various types to present on Braver Angels and what we do. Uh, if when I present, I usually include kind of a survey of the research on political polarization, what contributes to it. Uh, we also offer, you know, for groups like that who, who are wanting to work on uh, decreasing polarization, improving their communication, uh, to, to basically put on some workshops mm -hmm. for the local group. So that's the kind of thing that would be an opportunity for folks in Central Arkansas off your stance. So, so spread the word. If you have any groups, a church or someone like that that's interested in hearing from us, we're happy to work with you on that. Right. And I know we have a uh, like an ambassador here in Arkansas. He's also happens to be our red um, state coordinator, David Childs. And I know he has spoken, I believe, with like Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs. Um, he, I think he lives in the Hot Springs Village area. So he has actually done some speaking down there in some of the community clubs. So, um, you know, all of those. Also, I, wanna, I wanna add, this is a really important component. Uh, as Braver Angels National, when you get involved with Braver Angels on the national level, which you can go through the Arkansas Alliance, but we have, they will set up for you one-on-one -on -one conversations. And they have four different types of conversations that they do that with. They have uh, red and blue conversations. They have rural and um, uh, urban conversations. They have black and white conversations. And what's the other one, Glenn? Can you? Uh, do you I, I don't remember. Okay. But generational. Anyway, generate. Gener yes, right, April. I'm sorry. But I will tell you that something else that I've utilized, and I don't, I don't think I'm the only one. I actually have had personal one-on-ones because I have a Zoom room. I had to have a Zoom room because I was away from my family for a while. And so I have utilized having one-on-one -on -one conversations with several people across the United States that are involved with Braver Angels. And it's just, 
it's just like a friendly conversation. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not anything that's, uh, what, oh, go ahead, Glenn. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to, cause I know we're about to run out of time, but Rudy, I suggest uh, for everybody to go to a national braver angels and look up for the events and look for a skills for bridging the divide workshop. That's a great place to start because it covers a lot of these uh, communication techniques that we've been talking about and you have the chance to practice it there. And then if you like that, you can, you know, kind of, uh, you know, branch out from there. But I, I, I know we're about out of time, right, Jeannie? Yes, we are. And I want to just um, take a quick minute to thank uh, Fred Golder for coming with us tonight and, and speaking about his book and um, also, you know, relating, you know, how that fits in um, and doves, dovetails so nicely uh, with what the Braver Angels uh, organization does. And um, so April is going to kindly, um, if you'd like to be in our group picture, you might want to turn your video on so we can see your beautiful face, your smiling face. And April, I think, is going to do a group shot. Um, if you um, would rather not be in the group photo, um, you can leave the call if you'd like, because it's over now. But I do want to thank everyone for coming and for um, listening so well and asking so many wonderful, thoughtful questions. And for um, and don't forget the information that Glenn has put in the chat about how you can get in touch with us if you'd like to be further involved. So um, April, can you go ahead and do our photo? And um, for Yes Miller and Nancy, if you'd like to be in our photo, um, you, you're welcome to uh, turn your camera on if you'd like so we can see your face. I'm going to give you a one, two, three. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Okay, that's good. Thank Perfect. You. Okay, and thank you to everyone for coming and attending. And um, we hope to, um, you know, get to know all of you better. And please, you know, um, check out our website, check out our Facebook page if you're, if you're on Facebook. Um, and please get involved. We'd love to have you, especially to the folks here in central Arkansas, where we're hoping to get some more local involvement. So, um, Mr. Ripple, if you're interested, we'd love to follow up with you and help get you plugged in if you're interested in joining with us. And thanks to everyone, and I hope you have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Stay well. Jeannie, can we let everybody know that they can save the chat if they want to? If they go down to the bottom of the chat box where we write in messages, go over to the far right, there's the three little dots. If you, you know, if you click on the three little dots, it'll say save chat. So if there's any information in there that you wanted or, or I, something else I do, I take a uh, camera, uh, I'll actually use my iPhone and take a shot of some information that I might want to know. So uh, that's, that's another good. thing. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Jeannie. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Fred. Thanks, April. Take care, everybody. And, and thank, thank your wife for coming too. <laughs> thank you, thank April. You're the best. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Rudy. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.